to you, uh, Daniel Weave. Uh, he's here with his, uh, his wife, Jenna. Are you, are you speaking to Jenna? Okay. <laughs> you got the mic on, I guess, my coat. All right, da Daniel. So uh, I've known Daniel for 25 years, I guess, uh, when I came as a youth pastor in Rostron. And this, I, 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 I knew him as this guy that took these trips all over the world. And uh, then, then I met, I re reconnected when he was working for Rock of Ages, and we did some events in Saskatoon. And then he left for Nicaragua with his family uh, to give them an experience like no other. Um, so for the last five years, you've been in Nicaragua for, and, and, the, and you've, you've come home for the summers. And in the last couple of years, uh, they're coming home and, and working at the camp, and we're, we're seeking to support uh, Daniel and Jenna more and more in their ministry and also just uh, connecting that to our camp program as well. So we sent uh, four interns in January, you'll remember that, uh, that went to Nicaragua, and, uh, and Daniel um, worked with them and uh, had fun with them and uh, challenged them. And you'll hear some, some of his stories about what it means to be a, a ministry in today's world. So Daniel, if you want to come up, and I'll, I'll pray for you and get this computer going here. How do you go like this? You know the password, right? There we go. So that's your family. Four, four kids. Uh, oh, it's not on? Oops. It's go like this. Sometimes that works. That should do it. Let's pray. God, thank you for Daniel. Thank you for Daniel and Jenna and their, uh, um, their ministry in... in uh, in Nicaragua and here in Rostron as well. I just pray that you would just uh, open our hearts to, to hear what Daniel has to say and just give, uh, give wisdom and energy to Daniel as he speaks to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. I'll just take this off. I know you have a hard time believing that that woman is my wife because it doesn't really match up quite well. But uh, yes, I tricked her to marry me a long time ago. <laughs> and when I met her, actually, so, you know, we met, it was neutral. She didn't realize my intentions. I didn't really realize my intentions, so maybe that's how it happened. But on our very first night, um, I was telling her one day when, if the Lord wills, I have little kids, I'm going to live in a foreign country with them. You know, just to throw that out there before anything happens. And then when we got serious, I brought it up again. I was like, you know, I was serious about that, right? So, in or out. And um, so when our kids were, uh, we, had, we had two at the time, and I was looking at kind of their age and, and thinking, okay, we got to, it's time to set the clock. Because uh, my dream was for them to learn Spanish naturally. Well, at that point, we didn't know where, but I wanted them to learn another country. In, uh, in the context, and that was kind of um, one of my lifelong dreams. Uh, well, first of all, who am I? I, I grew up in Rostron, the enemy of Hague, I know, but so I appreciate you welcoming me in. Um, I was actually making fun of Hague speaking at kids' camp last week. <laughs> I was talking about how, well, it's because they were, truthfully, you were better at football than us, and so that automatically made you the enemy. And so, not that I was really into sports, but... Um, so I grew up in Rostron to uh, this lovely couple over here, and um, they came to, to, to see me today. And I, I always had it in my heart to, to live overseas. And so those who know me, they don't really know me because I'm educated or smart or anything. They just know I'm the guy who travels a lot and, uh, because that's always been me. I like to travel and not just to one place. I like to go all over the place. Mark says I like to cause a lot of chaos, whatever that means. But, um, <laughs> but you meant it. <laughs> but it's true. I kind of have this uh, attention deficit. Hey, want to go ride bikes? It's a joke, you know, like, anyway. Anyway, um, so, but, you know, that's a gift and a curse at the same time because I can do a lot of things and not always efficiently, but I can do a lot of things. So um, anyway, yeah, so did a lot of traveling, did Bible college, and um, 
eventually ended up at a, at a part-time at a church and part-time in construction. I always felt that I needed to work with my hands, and maybe it's the kind of have to be in two places at once sort of thing. But uh, I loved that. I loved, I was working with kids and youth in Saskatoon, and then I was renovating houses. So I had a team of guys, and then I would bounce back and forth, which didn't always go so good. And, um, and now that's what we do now. We bounce back and forth, but between countries. We, we first moved there, and we told our families really stupidly, we, we promised them, not promised, we said two to five years we would go live overseas. And I say stupidly because I needed to, I needed to be obedient to the Lord. And I know my parents understand that, but not all of our family members maybe fully understood that. And so when it came close to the five years, we were like, oh shoot, I just finally am learning Spanish. And, um, and so we, we decided what we think is a good compromise, and that is to spend the summers at, um, here in Canada. So, so we're here for four months and down in Nicaragua eight months for the foreseeable future. So, and we feel super blessed and privileged that it's so far working for us. And um, yeah, it's really fun. Our kids, um, they talk and say things that I have no idea what they're saying. And uh, that's really exciting for me. Um, that was like my dream when I watched them. My daughter has no accent. And I'm always like, Ari, what did they say? I didn't catch that. And she'd be like, oh, dad. They're just, you know, and then she'll like rattle off what they're saying. I'm like, really? You, you caught all that? Anyway, so, so it's really fun. And, and we do it, I do it because it was the passion of my heart. And I believe, I've always believed that the Lord gives us passions. And some of us are really good at something that somebody else is terrible at it. And um, I don't want to try to be that person. I want to be who the Lord's created me to be. And so I'm that guy who travels and isn't that smart. Um, this morning, I, I actually really wanted to take um, uh, what I was talking about at camp. Um, Mark and Gustavo do really well to give us a nice curriculum so we don't have to spend any time preparing. We can just go up there and talk, which is great. No, I'm, I'm joking. Of course we spend time. But, but, um, but I wanted to talk about hope. And uh, it's one of our, our curriculums at camp is, is in involving how to pray for hope. And the reason is because my, my heart and my passion in Nicaragua is for poverty and to help those in poverty. Nicaragua is the, the poorest country in the Americas next to Haiti and the highest illiteracy rate in, in all of those nations. And those are tied very closely. And traditionally, when we talk about missions, people ask, oh, what did you give them? What did you build them? What did you make for them? And the longer I'm there, yeah, I would love water. And the longer I'm there, I realize um, in my context, now this is not for everybody. One sec. But in my context, <clears throat> The more that I give, the, the more damage I do. And the reason that is, is because I'm taking th their hope away. You see, when you've worked hard for something, you've earned it, you feel an ownership over it, therefore you have hope, you can do it again. And maybe you can even do better. Um, and so in the context of Nicaragua, I found that to be really powerful. Uh, I'll back up a little bit. When we first moved there, we moved, um, we have some rental houses here and, and uh, we were able to afford to, to just move there. And I, I wanted to just learn the, the language and the culture. So we bought an ice cream store and we got residency that way. We sell ice cream. Don't make any money doing it, but we sell ice cream and we get to be in the culture. We got to know all the local business owners. There's people from Brazil, Argentina, not really the States, Europe, like all over, it's, it's really, um, it was really neat to really get into the, that side of it. And of course, Nicaraguan business owners. But, um, and then we came home for a bit, had a baby, had some trauma with all that. I cry a lot when I preach, so just ignore me. Um, uh, we came back and we, we found this amazing house. You see, Nicaragua in our first three months there had experienced, uh, we called it a revolution. It was essentially protests that were responded by the government with shooting. And a lot of, a lot of people died and a lot of people went to jail simply for waving their national flag in the streets. 
Uh, and so it, it got really ugly. So when we got back, the advantage was um, there was a ton of nice houses available for really cheap. And so we found this really beautiful house. This is us in the garden of our house, actually, or just kind of the yard. And that's right beside the swimming pool, which makes the 35 degrees a lot more bearable. Um, but this house was 500 bucks a month. And I felt really guilty because I was like, well, I brought my kids here so they could live in a little concrete house and be on the streets with all the street kids. But this is $500 a month and there's a pool. So <laughs> after not a lot of wrestling, we said yes to it. And, um, and then I remember I went there to, to drop something off. And then I decided to take my motorcycle a different way back. And there we were, like literally a block thanks, from like the poorest neighborhood I had yet seen in the city. And the Lord was like, see, I had a plan. So here we are in this beautiful house with a pool and we are right on the edge of a, of a plastic shack community. And I'm floored because I know in that moment, like, yes, I made the right decision. <laughs> and um, dealing with the people at the gate has turned out to be far better than I could have imagined because um, when people come to the door, like I said, I don't, I don't do handouts. And so therefore, I don't get a lot of people at the door because when they come to the door for a handout, I say, okay, well, I'll get a shovel, I'll get a wheelbarrow, and why don't we fix up this road a little bit and then we'll look at your power bill. And they usually don't come back. <laughs> But those who do come back, they, they, they feel, of course, rewarded, right? So forgive me for being all over the map. It's just kind of how my brain works. It's quite exhausting. Um, <laughs> so as I was saying, um, we got back. They had experienced a, quite a traumatic time with the revolution. We moved into this house. I'm still learning Spanish. I'm in the community. Started a Hot Wheels club in the community. Um, just tried to, like learn Spanish by walking with my kids and our animals. We had a, we've had a monkey, toucans, iguanas, those animals. Oh man, I don't know what else, like so many. So we would like take one of the animals and go walk through the village and everybody would want to pet it. And so we, anyway, like ways to get in. When my dad came, he brought his wooden cars and we went door to door and gave out wooden cars. And so just kind of getting to know the community and them getting to know me. And then COVID happened. And when COVID happened, um, Nicaragua didn't, they didn't shut down, well, they couldn't shut down, right, because people live day to day, but what happened is all the travelers left, that meant all the money stopped, and people started to get really desperate, and I realized in that moment, regardless of where my Spanish was at, now was the time. So we started, um, in that moment, we started classes. I hired a translator, because I knew my Spanish wasn't quite ready. The very first thing we did is we created some jobs. We dug holes and we cleaned garbage on the streets and put it in those holes and burnt the garbage. And that was the first thing we did. We kind of offered it out to different people and then I got to see who were the leaders of the, of the community. And that way I was able to, again, like get in the community, but I'm not doing handouts, but I'm, I'm here to help. We gave rice and beans to each of the pastors and we said, why don't you distribute this how you see fit? And then, and then we started doing classes with the kids because they weren't going to school anymore. So now we had a, a wide open opportunity to do education the way that, like just fun education. Um, our kids are in school there and I wasn't in school 50 years ago, but I'm told 50 years ago, what you do is you copy off the board and then you do a lot of homework. So that's kind of how it is now in Nicaragua. Most things are about 50 years behind. And so our kids spend all morning long copying off the board, and then they go home and do three hours of homework. Well, a lot of it is just straight memorization, which if you have a person like mine, it's in one ear and right up the next. Unless I'm practically building or seeing something, I'm probably not going to learn a whole lot, which is why Bible school was such a challenge for me. But my internship of traveling and doing missions was, was perfect for me. Um, we just all learn different ways. So with these kids, that's how they're learning. So we took classes and we started doing cooking classes, painting, crafts, sports, all these really fun things. We realized in that moment that most of the kids couldn't read 
or, or their reading was really, really bad. So we did a lot of reading. I did a lot of English. Um, there typically, they have an English class, but the English teacher never actually speaks English. They just give books. And of course, English is the most ridiculous language in the world to read. So you can imagine what that was like. Knife. Knife. Oh yeah, it would be knife in, in Spanish. So, but on the flip side, our kids learning to read in Spanish has proved to be a lot easier than if they were learning to read in English <laughs> because it actually makes sense. So that was kind of how things got started. And then we, and then we do carpentry class because I'm a carpenter. And so we, uh, I hired a local guy, actually. I'll pull that picture up. So uh, with the carpentry class, it's just like it sounds. We just build stuff with wood and, and the guys are learning just to work with their hands. So that's our teacher. His name is Uriel. And he's just there with a couple of our students. And we just start out in front of his house. And uh, we build everything from toys to chairs to tables to we built um, a whole shop for ourselves. So out of brick, laid the brick. And so learning the footings, learning the concrete, learning the brick lane. And so now, actually right now, these days, he has uh, most of those teenage boys hired and they're working on different projects around the city. So when I'm in Canada, I try to minimize how much stuff is going on there because I'm not there. So the relationship, there's a separation. And if I'm just sending money, then they just look at me as the bank. And that actually deteriorates my relationship with them. So I try to take a step back. And so last summer I did it and again this summer. And it's been really cool to watch that these boys, their parents in perspective, probably bring in about $7 a day would maybe be the average. 150 Cordobas, 180. Um, and they would just sell something on the street. They would go buy something in the market and then they would go door to door and sell those items. And they would maybe come home with five, five to $10 a day. Well, these guys, because they've now learned to work with their hands and carpentry, they're starting about, at about $10 a day is how much they're able to make at 13, 14, 15 years old. So that money, of course, goes to the family. And, and then that helps support. And so then they start to see the value in that. So it's been really fun to work with Uriel. He really has a heart for the guys. He's probably one of the only dad and mom family scenarios in our community, um, just because one of the fallouts of poverty is typically broken families and broken relationships. And so, so he's really, really been, been great for that. Um, poverty... Poverty is really messy. It's really, really messy. Um, we see it in Canada, of course. And, and I don't think it's a whole lot different in Nicaragua in terms of the mentality of poverty. So poverty is really something of the mind. Um, we probably all know somebody like that or have encountered people who you would say they're very poor. And in Canada, they don't lack opportunity. We do have opportunity, but... Um, but that doesn't mean the poverty doesn't exist. It doesn't mean it's any less real. And, and again, to break that poverty, people need hope. They need to overcome. I want to introduce you to some of the people um, yeah, that we're working with. This woman, her name is Cynthia. That's her, her son, Alex. She has three kids, three, three um, yes, Two of them are teenagers, and one of them is a younger, a younger boy. And uh, that's her house. It's literally what, where she lives. Her husband, I've met once. He's sometimes around. Sometimes he works and contributes to the family. Other times he disappears. And that's really quite normal for them. But her, her house is, is wood with plastic around it. But that's not the worst part. The worst is that it's like this awful slope, the whole of the property. And, and yet they don't ever do anything about it. They don't ever try to fix it up or make it better. We just realized after three years of being there, she doesn't even have a place to cook. She walks three houses over to her mom's house and then she cooks over there. Completely and totally defeat or defeated is how she lives. And how, how what, every time I see her, she's always looking sad and you just look at their house and you just think, wow, they've never taken ownership. And, um, and so that's, she's, she's one of the women now part of our savings program. So she's saving her money every week that we can change her house. We did an outreach night as our, um, with our teenage, our youth group essentially. We, we do an outreach night. And so we went to her house and it was like 
oh man, $30 to buy bricks and concrete to build her a little cooking stove? Like 30 bucks, seriously. And so, but again, she's so defeated that I was like, okay, look, two of her kids will be one, the ones building the stove. We're going to build it together. And, and as we started, you know, at first she's like, well, it can be over there. It doesn't really matter. And as we started to construct it, she got more and more excited, more involved. Like, well, we can do it here. And okay, well, we can have it like a lip. So like when I say stove, I mean a, a cooking platform. They put their wood there and their, their coals and then they cook over it. And, um, and then anyway, a few weeks later, we did another outreach night. But then I asked her to cook the food on her new stove. And that was really cool. So we show up to her house and now she has her stove. She just cooked on it. She, she repositioned her wash sink. She leveled it. And just like little, little baby steps of hope. And um, so that's Cynthia. This is M Maureen. And um, her, a little bit of an upgraded house, as you can see. Tin instead of plastic. But like five feet this way, there's another equal size shack. And it's like, like the yard is like the size of this stage, maybe a little bigger. And so her daughter and her daughter's three kids live there. So it's the two women and the three kids on this like, and then she tells me she wants to put another one behind for her other daughter who's now renting a house. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. So this woman is a, is a grandmother and, and wanting to provide for her family, but has just never been able to get enough enough hope or enough victory to, to get there. But she's part of our savings program. So every single week she brings us three to five dollars and she saves it with us. And then we're going to match that money so that in, in the form of material. So I, I told everybody, I made them sign a contract. I will not give you your money back. You know that, right? I don't care what emergency you have, I'm not giving you your money back. It comes in the form of concrete, bricks, or tin. And, but then it's doubled. And that, so that's, I mean, it's, a, it's great, but again, to teach them kind of little steps. This boy is Miguel. Miguel is really special to me. He's a very troubled young man. He lives with 17 people in a house about the size of this stage. Yeah, you walk in and it's literally just beds. And, and in Nicaragua, it is warm, like I said, 35 degrees. So your kitchen is outside. You sit around outside. You don't sit really in your house. Your house is kind of where your beds are and your stuff is. And um, he actually was part of our very first carpentry class. We built a little shelf about this big, coming down with three things on it. And, and his buddy has told me that he went and sold it. And I, and I told them all, you can make this, but you're not allowed to sell it. Because I knew they would go and sell it for less than the materials. So I checked up on him. I went like a week later, or two weeks later. And I go to his house, and his friends, no, no, he sold it, he sold it. And I go in, and I couldn't even see it, but it was there. It was so buried with clothes and stuff that you couldn't even see this thing. But it had been just jammed because... Basically, your clothes go on the floor under your bed or on top of your bed because they don't have things like dressers. That would be like a, that'd be like driving a Cadillac. So, um, so it was just really fun and neat to see it. But he's a boy who I just believe in him. He has such an awful home. Some of his aunties are prostitutes. Most of his uncles, he lives with his aunts and uncles mainly, and most of them are all drunks and or prostitutes and or fill in the blank. And um, it's just a really rough, rough situation. And, um, but he is a very regular guy at the gate. And I have to get creative to make work for him. And a lot of days, I don't know, I don't know what to do for him, but I want to give him work, right? Because he's willing. He climbs up our coconut trees and gets the coconuts down. He cleans the street. He cleans the garden. He'll, he'll do it all. And uh, one weekend, he even tried to break into our house when we were gone. But... <laughs> But it's, it's messy and it's beautiful. And last year, he learned the alphabet because of my teacher. That is so cool. I have a video of him just struggling through that alphabet. That was tough. But the excitement, you know, and his, and his friends were trying to learn too. And, 
we, we had a thing where I'll take you to McDonald's if you can learn the alphabet. <laughs> so I had a few boys learn the alphabet that way uh, because McDonald's is like going to the keg down there. It's, it's, uh, it's high class. And um, so that was really fun. But he's just somebody who I really, I really believe in. There's another woman in our savings program. This guy here is our teacher. He's one of our teachers. His name is Javier, and he's actually a really expert carpenter. Uh, not carpenter, painter, sorry. Expert painter. And uh, so he does really neat, creative paintings. And for my birthday last year, he painted me the Besbro Hotel, a picture, because he, he knew that I was from this city, Saskatoon. We were living there. And out of the blue, he comes, and it was, it was like really, really well done. And that's Christiane. She was on the intern with us. One of our carpentry boys. Another woman in our savings program. Um, Christopher holding my bird like a baby. And uh, this, boy, this boy has downs. And so now that I work at the camp with people with special needs, he's like even more special to me. Because in Nicaraguan culture, when you have somebody with a, with a, um, a special need, typically you hide them away because culturally it's, they're just having a hard time making acceptance. And there's still some of that old belief that it's your fault or it's uh, demonic or something like that. So, so just again, old 50 years ago kind of stuff mentality. But this boy, he's right in our community. Everybody knows him. And he's a really good worker. So he actually comes under the wing of one of the pastors and he's like his right-hand man. And it's just so great to see him out and about. Where, where the interns came, we did VBS in this one church called Pani Vida, which means bread of life, or bread in life. <clears throat> and, uh, and he was right there with us every day and uh, just really involved, which is really cool. Anyway, enough of that. Um, let's turn to the word. I, wanna, I wanted to look at um, the... The scripture passage was the, the, the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. That's what, the, what um, Gustavo had chosen as the, the biblical story for hope. And at first I was like, oh, that's an interesting you know, passage for that. But actually after diving into it, it's so perfect. Um, because you see, the woman, the Samaritan woman, was completely without hope, right? So there's the Samaritan woman, she's at the well, and Jesus walks up to her and, you know, they start chatting and, and she's like, he says, go get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, you're right because you have, what is it, four husbands or five husbands and the man you're now with isn't actually your husband. I was sharing this story at camp about the Samaritan woman and I was like, how many of you know somebody who's like the Samaritan woman without hope? And this girl's like, my mommy, because she has what? And I was like, no, no, let's stop right there. Let's cut that off. <laughs> and, but, but, but I was asking, how many of us feel like that Samaritan woman? Where There we are, we're completely without hope. We've tried. We've tried different things. And in the context of the people I work with, it's mainly children and women. The men, they come and go, unfortunately. And with a lot of these women I'm working with, um, in Nicaraguan culture, you look for a man to provide. And in a lot of times, that's your only hope, is to find somebody. Who, and so you'll take whatever you can get. And so if he's around this week, gone next week, I'll take it. If he brings, if he brings a little bit of rice and beans home, I'll take it. So looking at this story of the Samaritan woman, you know, I don't know what she was going through, but man, I imagine her to be one of these women that I just showed you the pictures of. And there she is, completely defeated, um, tried many times for new hope, put her hope in a man. And Jesus comes along, and, and, and you know, Jesus didn't build her a house, didn't give her the money in his pocket. He didn't even give her food. He gave her hope, because that's what she needed the most. He spoke into her life. Jesus said in verse 13, this is from the message, so it's a little different. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water that I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artisan, artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. 
And the woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty and I won't have to come back to this well again. So she immediately wants to, well, just give it to me so I don't have to work anymore because she's still not understanding. He said, no, go call your husband and then come back. Well, I don't have a husband, she said. And again, it's like, she doesn't say, I don't have a husband, or she doesn't say, well, yeah, I'll get the man I'm with and just pretend he's my husband. It's the, well, I don't have a husband. You know, when I picture these women I work with, I have this one family, every time I, I get come near down the block, her countenance changes. You know, it's, and, and, and I get that a lot. And, and I kind of, it's a little cute to me, I guess, but maybe I shouldn't laugh, but it, but it, but I know the game they're playing, and all the neighbors know already that I don't play that game. And I am, I am here to help. That's why I'm here. But I help in a very different way. And, um, and so again, like, so I, I picture this woman being like this, you know, well, I don't, I don't have one. And, and Jesus calls her out on it. Yeah, you're right. That's nicely put. I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this, our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship, right? Believe me, woman, this is Jesus speaking, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your worship, your guessing in the dark, we Jews worship in the clear day of light. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews, but the time is coming. It has, in fact, already come. When what you're calling will no matter, when what you're called will no matter, and where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship, worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. I, I like how the message puts it. And again, the message is more of uh, expanding, I guess, on the words, on the language. But, but I like those who are honestly themselves. And as I work with these people in poverty, um, of course, they think, well, I need to get my life together in order to do this. And for these women, well, you know, I'm in living with this man and I need to marry him, but I have no money to marry him. And in this culture, if you have a wedding, you have to invite all your, all your family. Otherwise, it's a huge shame. And shame is a huge thing in this culture. And so they're stuck. And they're, they're in a bit of this cycle. I know a young woman who loves Jesus and wants to follow him, wants to be a Christian, but she won't go to church because she hasn't married her man of 13 years because she can't afford to. And, and it's this cycle that people get stuck in. And, and Jesus offers hope by saying, hey, just be you. Just be you. That's what I'm asking for. You know, I said at the beginning, Nicaraguans aren't the only ones in poverty. We all know somebody who's in poverty, and maybe we ourselves have been in poverty. Maybe you yourself. For me, my struggle is that I don't, it's not that I don't have hope, it's that I too quickly put hope in other things. Even in my ministry, so often I put my hope in my programs. What can I do to change the poverty? When, is God interested in me making a really great drop-in center, not so much. He's really inter just interested in people. He's interested in our hearts. And does he want to change our circumstance? Absolutely. And he will. But, it, but the two go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. In Isaiah 55, one of my favorite passages in verse 8 and 9, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's idea of eradicating poverty in my community is way better, way bigger than mine. 
And God's ways of pulling us out of our self-aspired hope is way bigger than ours. And I think a lot of us, even though if you've been a Christian for 40 years, 50 years, 10 years, 2 years, it's so easy to fall into this trap of finding our hope in ourself. In Canada, we have so many good opportunities to provide for ourselves. I was in India many, many moons ago, and a young man said to me, how do you in Canada have faith? Like, like do Canadians have faith, like, to believe God for stuff? And I was like, well, yeah, of course. Like, this trip I'm on, we, you know, we kind of left with hardly any money in our pocket. And this guy's like, huh, but it must be hard. I was like, yeah, you're right. It absolutely is. He said, you know, if I need shoes, first I need faith. I can't just buy shoes, that's crazy. I have to have faith for every single thing that I that I that is on my body. And that's my experience now. Nicaraguans are, man, they're so beautiful and amazing in the way that they have faith, in the way that they believe for stuff. I don't know a single person in my community that doesn't believe in God. Like really believe in God. Are they following God? Maybe not. And a lot of that has to do with the shame or it has to do with the, the spirit of religion that they just can't fit into that. But I don't know anybody who has ignored or forgotten about God. In Canada? Yeah, yikes. And are we better off that we have all the stuff? We've got big bellies because we're fed. Well, they have big bellies there too, but it's because the guy of Pinto. Beans and rice with a ton of oil. Um, but, but Jesus wants to say to, to those Nicaraguans, and he wants to say to each one of you this morning, put your hope in me. I am your source of hope. So if you have no hope this morning, put your hope in Jesus. And if you've been putting your hope in something else, put your hope in Jesus. It's only in him and it's only through him. And I forget that over and over again, whether it's ministry at the camp with troubled youth or whether it's ministry in Nicaraguan with troubled youth. We're just surrounded by hurting people. We're we're surrounded by the Samaritan woman who's just totally without hope. And man, we can offer that hope to people. In our workplace, how many of us know somebody, rub shoulders with somebody in our workplace who's just, they're, they're done, they've forgotten hope or they've gotten some weird slump of, of just, if I can just get that paycheck, if I can get that promotion, that raise. But we know as believers, it's not about that. It's not about that, the raise, it's not about what we can accomplish in our life. It's just about being who we are, who God created us to be in that element and then offering that hope to the people around us. I want to close with this passage from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? And these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Almighty with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep, and the roar of your waterfalls, and all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock and my redeemer, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. As my foes taunt me all day long, saying to me, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? And why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, 
for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you.